With over 23,000 casualties, the Battle of Antietam stands out as the single bloodiest day in American history. And after the battle, the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac would move on and they would continue fighting each other constantly all the way until April of 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse. But even though they had moved on, the people of Sharpsburg were left to deal with the aftermath. This whole entire area became one giant graveyard. There were over 4,000 dead who were buried all over this area. The town of Sharpsburg was completely transformed. Homes and businesses and churches uh, had been converted into field hospitals that, that were filled with the wounded and the dying. Uh, right here on the roulette farm, this farm alone had over 700 burials right here on this property. Well, obviously, this was going to be a bit of an issue for these people. You couldn't plow these fields. And over the next few years, the, the bones of the dead in these hastily dug graves started coming to the surface. You had uh, some mass graves where soldiers were buried in trenches. Some were individual graves where maybe they had a piece of wood with the name etched into it. And over the next few years, it was decided that something had to be done. So all of these graves would have to be dug up and all of the dead would be reinterred in places like the cemeteries that we're going today, one of which is the Antietam National Cemetery. We've moved over now to the Antietam National Cemetery and the, the ground that we are standing on right now was originally purchased by the state of Maryland, 11 and a quarter acres for the establishment of a cemetery for the, the dead of the Maryland campaign. So it's not just Antietam soldiers who are here, uh, but also soldiers from South Mountain and also from the, the Battle of Monocacy. Now the original plan was to have both Union and Confederate soldiers buried here together but the, the people in this area were so upset about the idea of that. Keep in mind, this is March of 1865. The war is still going on, and these people were very embittered about what had happened here, that that plan was abandoned, and the Confederates who were disinterred were reburied uh, in places like Hagerstown uh, and around Frederick, and I think there's some around Shepherdstown as well. Uh, we're going to be going to a few of those later. But uh, anyway, uh, Chris from Vlogging Through History is also doing a video. We've been working in conjunction with one another on uh, this Antietam series, and he also has a video where he is here at the Antietam National Cemetery. Uh, I I'm not going to go as in depth as what he is, but we're gonna take a look at a, a few of these graves. When you come to the Antietam National Battlefield, one thing that you will notice is that all of the graves here are grouped by state. So this right here is the Pennsylvania section. And if we move over here, well, this is looking at the section with New York soldiers. And the effort to, to locate these graves and identify the soldiers uh, must have been one heck of a task. Uh, and there were two area men who, who did a lot to uh, help disinter these soldiers and identify them and, and get them up here to the cemetery. Uh, those men, they were Aaron Good and Joseph Gill. And this is something that took months in order to accomplish. And uh, the, the way that they would identify them, uh, they were identified by letters or maybe pay receipts or diaries or photographs. Uh, in some cases, let me see if I can find one here. Um, oh yeah, here we go. 
Let me back up. So in some cases, you couldn't identify the soldier by name. So you'll see a lot of these graves right here where it says unknown, um, but we know that this soldier was from New York. Well, that might be uh, a mark on their cartridge box or, or, or something like that, or maybe on their, their cat badge. Um, so anyway, another thing that helped these guys was uh, a burial map from a guy named Elliot who had marked where all of the burials were on the battlefield. Now it wasn't just these two men who were doing the work. They had a, a workforce that was made up of discharged soldiers and, and locals. But man, uh, this must have been one heck of a job. I just mentioned the the Elliot burial map of Antietam and I plan on maybe doing a, a video on this sometime in the future but I'll just give it quick mention uh, there was a, a man by the name of SG Elliot who showed up here to the the battlefield and and laid out this map showing where all of the dead Union and Confederate soldiers were after the battle. He, he later did one uh, in Gettysburg. That's probably the burial map that he's most well noted for. Uh, interestingly enough, the Antietam burial map uh, wasn't really, I guess, rediscovered uh, until 2020, whenever uh, my buddy Tim Smith happened upon it at the New York Public Library. It's still there today. But anyway, that map has helped us to understand the, the burials uh, here at Antietam much better. Something that's interesting to note, I, I mentioned that there were over 4,000 uh, dead here at Antietam. The Elliott burial map shows around just over 5,800. Uh, so there's, there might be a little bit of a discrepancy in numbers there. But uh, something else that's kind of interesting kind of goes back to a prior video that I did with Gary Edelman here uh, where we talked about photography during the Battle of Antietam. Well, the photography at Antietam also connects to this cemetery. Now, on the video that Gary Edelman and I did on uh, Civil War photography here at Antietam, we went to the spot of one photo that Alexander Gardner took that uh, shows some soldiers at the base of the tree. And I think the name of the photo is a lone grave on battlefield of Antietam. Well, if, if you take a close look at that grave, well, you see the name of John Marshall, who was in the 28th Pennsylvania. Uh, well, because of that photo, and also because of the Elliott burial map, which for some reason uh, marks the grave of John Marshall, the, or the field grave, uh, we know a little bit about him. Uh, John Marshall, as I mentioned, was in the 28th Pennsylvania. Uh, he was 50 years old at Antietam and uh, was, was an Irish stonemason from uh, Allegheny City. And uh, he died right there close to where the, the visitor center is today. And uh, he was reinterred right here at grave 3600 at the Antietam National Battlefield. In the episode that we did at Burnside Bridge, we showed an Alexander Gardner photo that uh, showed some temporary graves of some 51st New York guys along the stone wall that, that runs along the creek. Well, if you cross-reference that with the rosters and also with the Elliott burial map, well, one of the names on the Elliott burial map was Edward Miller, and uh, he appears on the rosters for the, uh, the 51st New York, and uh, his name is actually etched in one of those temporary grave markers. Uh, Edward Miller was 18 years old whenever he was killed there at Burnside Bridge, so uh, another young guy who, who would not uh, see old age due to the, the Civil War. Uh, but yeah, pretty interesting to be able to cross-reference you know, the photos and the burial map and then to be able to see where the original grave was and then where 
these soldiers were reinterred. I, I do want to be clear on something, though. I would love to portray myself as the smartest guy in the room here. Uh, I'm drawing pretty much all of this from an article that Gary Edelman wrote on the American Battlefield Trust website. So thankful for, you know, all of these uh, intelligent, hardworking people who have kind of laid the groundwork and foundation for the rest of us to learn from. But yeah, really, really interesting to see this grave. Here's something that is kind of funny to me. Uh, the dedication of this cemetery was on the fifth anniversary of the battle, so September 17th of 1867. And the man who was invited to speak at that dedication was President Andrew Johnson. Well, here they, they do have one information panel that has a few of his words, but the, the thing that people pay most attention to is uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. In the middle of the Antietam National Cemetery is this colossal statue. Uh, this is the, the private soldier monument. And uh, the whole thing is 44 feet and 7 inches tall. And if you include the base, is 250 tons. Uh, so the, the soldier itself uh, is in two pieces uh, joined at the waist. As a matter of fact, if we, if we zoom in a little bit, we might even be able to kind of see where the the seam is for this soldier and then down below it says not for themselves but for their country september 17th 1862. Uh, now something that's kind of interesting uh, about about this uh, statue and about this uh, this memorial um, it, it was designed by a guy named uh, Batterson, who was from uh, Connecticut, and I think cost like around $32,000 or something like that. It, it originally stood at the gateway of the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1876, so everybody could, you know, see it. And then it was disassembled to come right here to Sharpsburg, but there was a problem. Um, the, uh, the top half... Uh, fell into the Dadgum River uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, so they had to retrieve it, and then it came up the, the C&O Canal and uh, was dedicated here on September 17th of 1880. Here's a monument that is interesting to me that I thought that I'd point out. This is for the 20th Regiment of the New York Volunteers, also known as the Turner Rifles. And... If you look over here, it says erected in memory of our fallen comrades by the survivors of the regiment. Well, one thing that people maybe overlook quite a bit whenever they're talking about the Civil War on the Union side is that a lot of these soldiers were immigrants. So in this case, they were German immigrants. So you can see that same inscription marked in German on this side. As a matter of fact, a lot of regiments you know, you would go through them, and uh, if you walked through their camp, they weren't speaking English. Like, they were speaking uh, German or, uh, you know, some other language. But anyway, that's reflected here in this monument. Well, here is the grave of one Werner von Bischel, who was a captain in the 6th Wisconsin, which, of course, was a regiment in the famous Iron Brigade. And uh, what makes Bachel kind of noteworthy, uh, in addition to his service, uh, is his dog. Uh, he had a, a Newfoundland dog that Rufus Dawes writes about. And uh, I'm just going to read a section from Rufus Dawes' book. Uh, so, so Von Bachel, who was the commander of Company F, was uh, killed at uh, Turner's Gap at the Battle of South Mountain. And... Uh, here it says, Captain Bachel was an ex-officer of the French army, brought up as a soldier in the Napoleonic school. He was imbued with the doctrine of fatalism. His soldierly qualities commanded the respect of all, and his loss was deeply felt in the regiment. Bachel had a fine Newfoundland dog, which had been trained to perform military salutes and many other remarkable things. In camp, on the march, and in line of battle, this dog was his constant companion. The dog was by his side when he fell. Our line of men left the body when they retreated, but the dog stayed with his dead master 
and was found on the morning of the 19th of September lying upon the body. We buried him with his master. So far as we knew, no family or friends mourned poor Bashel, but it's probable that he was joined in death by his most devoted friend on earth. Now, von Bashel was reinterred here at the National Cemetery, and uh, it's probable that his dog is buried with him. All right, well, uh, that was just a, a few of the graves here of the Union soldiers at the Antietam National Cemetery. As for right now, we're gonna go ahead and hop in our vehicle and uh, head down the road and try and find some of the final resting places of the Confederates who died here at Antietam. driven over now to Hagerstown, Maryland, to the Rose Hill Cemetery. And within the Rose Hill Cemetery, there's another cemetery called Washington Confederate Cemetery. And I've never been here before. I didn't know what to expect, uh, but this one is different. So in 1871, the Washington Confederate Cemetery uh, was purchased by the state of Maryland to have a place for the Confederate dead. Uh, of course, the Antietam National Cemetery had already been established. And this is it. Uh, you were looking at all of the Washington Confederate Cemetery, which obviously is completely absent of any grave markers. I was hoping to maybe tell uh, the story of a, a few of the Confederate soldiers who were buried here, but I I have to be honest, this is unlike anything that, that I've ever seen. Uh, kind of kind of sad. So there are 2,468 soldiers who are buried here. 346 are identified. Uh, so this monument uh, was placed here in February of 1877, and uh, the, the dedication was later that year. They had Major General Fitzhugh Lee, who was a uh, cavalry general and uh, was the nephew of Robert E. Lee. He was here and spoke, and uh, later there was a rededication where um, President Eisenhower spoke. This is pretty hard to see. But uh, they have a, an etching here that is essentially a map of the Washington Confederate Cemetery. And uh, there in the corner it says, Dedicated June 12, 1877, Speaker Major General Fitzhugh Lee, CSA. And as I'm looking at this, well, if we were to, to look out here ahead of us, well, you can refer to to this map and see that for example right here are buried 34 boxes and 68 unknown bodies just ahead so a little bit closer to us are 26 bodies are 26 boxes and 47 unknown bodies uh, and then kind of out along the fringes there there are some names of the the identified dead but most of what we are looking at here in the Washington Confederate Cemetery is a large what really amounts to a mass grave of mostly unknown soldiers Well, uh, for what it's worth, that's uh, Washington Confederate Cemetery. Like I've said already a few times, definitely different than anything that I expected whenever I came here. 
Uh, there's a, another Confederate cemetery that's not too far away uh, in the town of Frederick that I think we're going to uh, go take a visit to next. I've moved now to Mount Olivet Cemetery in Frederick, Maryland. And uh, Frederick County during the Civil War was kind of like a hospital center. So a lot of soldiers on both sides found themselves right here in this county if they were wounded uh, in any of the battles that were fought in this area. So there's South Mountain and there's Sharpsburg. Uh, later in the war, there's going to be a battle not too far from here in Monocacy. Uh, and then there's also, you know, a lot of skirmishes and things like that. So a, a lot of Confederate dead ended up right here at this cemetery, and it's kind of unique. Uh, there are over 300 of them buried in a straight row in something called Confederate Row. Right here in Mount Olivet Cemetery, we are looking at what is known as Confederate Row. And, and what it looks like is that they just dug one straight trench and buried all of these bodies side by side. Now, one thing that is nice is that we have headstones for these men. And uh, even if it's kind of illegible like this one, well, they have newer markers up behind. So for example, this guy right here, Raisin Pitts, who was a private in Company B of the 6th Alabama Infantry. Uh, he died September 26th of 1862. Uh, I may not know anything about him, you know, as far as biographical information, but I do know something about the 6th Alabama. That was John B. Gordon's brigade and they fought at the Bloody Lane. Uh, the death date of September 26th, well, maybe he was wounded there and then just died shortly after. Uh, here are a couple more guys who were in Rhodes' brigade. So the 12th Alabama and the 6th Alabama, another one from John B. Gordon's regiment. And then it just continues on and on and on. Men, here, here's one from the 8th Florida, the 7th South Carolina. Um, a lot of 1862 dates here. So these could have been uh, South Mountain or Antietam or um, some of the, the skirmishes also in that campaign. Okay, so here's another guy from the, the 12th Alabama, uh, died October 3rd of 1862. And this line of Confederate dead just keeps going and going and going. All right, well, there you go. Those are just uh, some of the final resting places of the men who fought for both the Union and the Confederacy on the bloodiest day in American history.